real dirty bird. Now listen. <laughs> you. He didn't like to conform at all. He loved being a naughty boy. We put a claw. <laughs> I'd sidle up to it. I would never go straight to the emu because it'd look you in the eye. Who are you? <laughs> and then it would attack. <laughs> I really lost my temper with him. <laughs> the TV show was successful beyond anybody's dreams. <laughs> Dad was always there to play with us. If I ever become like him, I'll be very happy and I'll know that I've succeeded. <laughs> In the 1970s and 80s, Rod Hull enjoyed success as one of Britain's best known and loved entertainers, along with a temperamental and much feared sidekick. What kind of brain would think of this creature? I mean, why did you pick an emu? Because I... I couldn't get my hand up a budgery gun. <laughs> Rodney Stephen Hull was born in 1935 on the Isle of Sheppey in Kent. We were friends for 59 years, from the age of five years of age when we started school together, the infant school. Ginger, my mother used to call him, here comes Ginger. Go oh, look at him, she say. Someone's combed his hair with a frying pan. <laughs> Growing up in wartime Britain, Rod developed a love of entertaining, amusing his friends and family from an early age. During the war, we were in the same bedroom, and I would get scared fairly easily, but he had a candlestick, and he would sit at the end of the bed and do shadow pictures on the, on the wall for me until I fell asleep telling me stories. We did a comedy act, and I was a straight man, Rob was a comedian. Rod would play the violin, and I would have a go out at the piano and keys would fall off, the violin would collapse, you know. It was a dreadful act, but you know, I enjoyed every moment of it. I think they thought they were film stars. They weren't. They were lovely, though. Despite dreams of stardom, on leaving school, Rod trained as an electrician. And in 1958, he married his childhood sweetheart, Sandra. He was totally and utterly besotted with her. He thought she was the most gorgeous thing he'd ever seen in his life. If Rod fell for somebody, he really fell. <laughs> but Rod still longed for a career in comedy. His break would come care of his sister Joan, who had recently emigrated to Australia. I wrote to him and I said, look, they're just starting television. I said, for God's sake, if you want to be in something, get here now. Rod found work as a studio technician for Australia's Channel 9. He and Sandra moved to Sydney's northern beaches. Family life was complete with the birth of their two daughters. Dad was always there to play with us more than anything. As soon as you got in the car, you sang. You sang as you left home and you sang when you arrived back. As Rod's young family grew, his career began to flourish. I think he went in to Channel 9 originally because he was an electrician, he went in as a lighting man, but then, you know, at the same time he was putting his scripts around and meeting people and everything. And next thing, Rod had his own show out here called Caper Cops. Constable Clot is all set to fly to Fiji for a holiday, but Slippery Sam knows a trick or two. And in 1969, he caught the eye of British television star Warren Mitchell, who cast him as the sidekick in his Australian comedy series. Right, watch. <laughs> in the box. Right. <laughs> the Rod had a devilish thing in him, which he loved playing japes, jokes and wheezes. There was a game called the lift game. We'd all get into the hotel lift on the top floor and then if there was no one in the lift, we'd throw ourselves on the floor with feet up in the air and up against the wall. So when the lift landed, uh, the bottom, people were waiting to get in, the doors were open, there'd be three people spread all over the floor. And we had blood capsules, which we had running out of our mouths. And you'd get up and say, God, that's the fastest lift I've ever been in. You know, and everyone would step back and would take the next lift. And that was the fun of being on tour with a man. He loved being a naughty boy. 
and in 1970, Rod discovered the perfect outlet for this naughtiness. He's got a beak and feathers and things with the poor old fella ain't got no wings. Buried in a dusty props cupboard in Sydney's Channel 9 studio. He can't fly, but I'm telling you, we can run the pads of a kangaroo. My first encounter with the emu was actually Rod's house. And I, something happened, I bent down for something, and I got bloody goosed by this thing, and I turned around, and it's Rod laughing with this bloody emu. But as one perfect partnership came together, another was falling apart. Rod and Sandra's marriage floundered when he met Cher Hilton, a young Australian artist. I met Rod in Sydney. I thought, what a strange character. He was sort of long and lanky, and he did make everyone laugh, though. Cher came into his life, and he truly, truly fell in love with her, head over heels, you know. In 1970, in order to further his career, Rod persuaded the whole family to return to England. Cher soon followed. It was just suddenly sort of presented to us, that's it, we're all moving back to England. Obviously, he stopped being husband, but he was still dad. That role to him was still important. With his marriage over and Cher now at his side, Rod tried to launch his career in England. He really was a frustrated writer and he was going around agents, he wasn't getting anywhere. I said, put Emu on for your next time you meet the agent. This shy, diffident man leant down and put this Emu on his arm and all hell broke loose. You have never in your life seen anything like this. There's dust and contracts, and, and we sat there, I, I can't stop laughing. Signed on the spot, Rod and Emu were soon unleashed on an unsuspecting British public. Queen Mother is greeted by Bernard Delfont, president of the fund. He stood on the side of that stage and he was saying to himself, what makes you think you can get out there and perform? He'd torture himself. What he's going to do now is going to leap through this hoop, which I've got down here. <laughs> Then he'd go out there, and it was amazing. He put the house down. Waiting to go on stage was an old friend. I could hear from my dressing room the roar of the laughter. You! I'm talking to you! It wasn't a laugh, it was a scream. You know that wonderful scream you can hear sometimes? He likes me. He likes you. <laughs> Having triumphed on stage, Emu performed an anarchic encore in the royal receiving line. Because you have to have a certain amount of decorum, don't you? And I didn't quite know what to do, so I thought I'd bow very low. And as I bowed, Emu's head came face to face with her bouquet. And again, it was, it was just a reaction. You went, chum, like that. <laughs> and she, she was left holding a bunch of stalks. <laughs> I think that was the thing that was in the paper the next day. After those, uh, then he was just in demand. And so began a reign of TV terror that would delight audiences for over 20 years. The amazing thing with Emu, when it was lying in its box, it was just what it was, a rather tatty Emu. The moment it went on his arm, it had an elegance, it had a style, and it was real. Yeah! <laughs> I read a G, G, sleep! When I would dress Rod, Emu would still be alive, it would be, moving and uh, pecking at my ear or tugging at my clothes. <laughs> he really had a knack of splitting his brain in two so that he was still having a sensible conversation and this thing was alive. You. <laughs> it frightened the living daylights out of you and if it took a dislike to you, it, it would cross its beak like that. There, you have a go. Oh, no! <laughs> 
then it would attack. <laughs> <laughs> you feared for your life. <laughs> I'd sidle up to it. I would never go straight to the emu because it'd look you in the eye. And this is in a dressing room. I mean, this is madness, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sidling up to his hand. In 1976, Rod and Emu became a regular, if chaotic, part of children's television. Rod was making it up as he went along a lot of the time. That was his great art. Give him time, let the mischief go on, and then suddenly, out of the mischief, will come stunning sequences. <laughs> the TV show was successful beyond anybody's dreams, certainly even beyond Rod's. <laughs> the amazing part was that television, I think, underestimated the way kids love mischief and chaos. But Rod and Emu's most chaotic and mischievous moment was yet to come. Wow! A dirty bird. Now listen. <laughs> By the mid-1970s, no TV entertainment show was complete without the anarchic Emu dragging Rod in its destructive wake. There is a part of Rod that came out in that Emu. You can't fake that. You can't make it into an act. It has to come from within. He didn't like to conform at all. He hated the norm. He just, that just wasn't him. He just didn't believe in certain rules. I remember driving him with him once and I said, Rod, I think there's a policeman behind us. And he said, I hope he doesn't ask for my license. I haven't got one. <laughs> Rod's unruliness reached its peak in 1976 with a chat show appearance that became one of the iconic moments in television. I think that when we booked Rod Hull, we knew what we were going to get. I didn't quite know what it was, the degree, otherwise I wouldn't have booked him with hindsight. You're all right, aren't you? Why is it so aggressive? It's not aggressive. Not much. <laughs> it's not all the time. I was going to get done over. We allowed for that. We put him on first, which meant we got rid of him. We could rearrange the set and the debris. <laughs> I really lost my temper with him. I, I mean, but the absurdity is forever after that, it became the thing I, I was remembered for most of all, which tells you something about the job. Everybody remembers that sequence. It was priceless. You can't rehearse that, but when it happens, absolute magic. He moved from being a comedy speciality act into being a TV personality. No other puppet act, in my experience, has ever achieved to that level what he achieved. With career success came personal happiness. In 1979, Rod married his second wife, Cher, and along with her daughter, set up home in Kent. He was at his happiest and most calm, most relaxed, um, when he was with the family. Rod and Cher went on to have three children together. Parenting was certainly an interesting thing with him. He did the classic thing of, you know, you're on the bike and you're doing the pedaling and he's holding behind you and then just lets you go. And then when you turn round and you realise that he's, he's gone, and you think, oh, brilliant, but he'd do it in a small enclosed area. So you just plough into the wall and hadn't told you to stop, brake, steer or anything of that sort. So I'd say they were probably the earlier memories. I guess I never really knew what Dad did until I got to school and everybody at the school playground would remind me about what my dad did. We knew very well that work was work, family was family, and never did the two mix. So that was, that was what we grew up with. But if Rod's family didn't see much of Emu, millions of children did. His television shows proved enormously popular with young viewers, though success came at a price. I think he got fed up with Emu to the degree that no one wanted to see him without Emu, but I think he accepted that that's how he was seen, and that's, that was his, his life. I'm very relieved, so am I, not to see Emu with you. Does it feel a little bit odd, sort of? No, no. I, I feel quite normal without him. <laughs> All he wanted in life was really his typewriter, a glass of brandy, and a pipe. Love the pipe, miss the pipe. That's how you used to find Dad in the house. It was pointless shouting, Dad, because you, know, you just wouldn't hear it. So you used to 
follow your nose, <laughs> literally, <laughs> to, to where Dad was. <laughs> By 1987, Emu had made Rod a millionaire, enabling him to buy the property that had inspired Charles Dickens to write Great Expectations, Restoration House in Rochester, Kent. It was basically derelict when it was bought, and one of Dad's other great passions was preserving the past. As we're walking around and going, oh no, this is going to be too much. We can't take this one on. But of course, he just said, Got to have it. But restoring the house to its former glory proved an expensive job. We had the scaffolding around for 18 months, workers all the time. Two huge chimney breasts had to be taken down, each brick numbered and put back because it's a grade one listed property. So it was an enormous job. Even on the phone, I could hear how difficult it was becoming. He was talking to me about having to go on tour or having to do appearances, far more than usual, just to get the money in to restore Restoration House. And at the worst time imaginable, Rod was hit by a series of financial blows. Rod's shows were always very expensive, and as television became more cost-conscious, then there were casualties, and regrettably, uh, Rod was one of those. So we had an accountant, but there was a number of years that no tax was paid. And when it was finally brought to our attention, it was 650,000 pounds. The comedian Rod Hull has put his home, Restoration House, in Rochester up for sale. He put it on the market, reduced the price down, 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 down. No takers, until there was no time left. The bank were wanting the money, so they took it. Rod Hull was declared bankrupt in September 1994. Agreeing that Cher should take the children to her native Australia to protect them, he faced the music alone. We pretty much were told that we were going to go to Australia for a holiday, and I, I see that now as mum's reason to get us out of the country in the, in the time, knowing what we'd have to go through in school and just trying to remove us from that completely, and I thank them for that. But missing dad was, was tough, very tough. Fatalistically said, OK, it's gone, so... I'm no worse off than I was when I first came back to this country. I had nothing then and I can do it all again. And, and he started off again. And, but I think it uh, gave him a nasty old shock. Well, I know it did. Rod moved into a small ramshackle cottage in the village of Icklesham in Sussex. I just thought it was a shed in a field when I first saw it. But to Dad, it was fantastic. He somehow could see positive in what you and I would probably think, that doesn't look positive at all to me, that's, that's a negative, but not Rod. In 1997, he was joined by his son Oliver, back in England to go to college. And we're going to have some coffee instead. Yes. Mum phoned me up once and accused me of living an eccentric retiree's life. And I said, it's brilliant. It's absolutely so much fun. Now my work is done. Trying to get the breakfast. <laughs> oh, you look fabulous, Dad. To me, he became Dad again. And he could just pick up a phone and say, hey, what are you doing today? And then you could arrange to get together two hours later instead of two months later. Ah. Ah. Yeah, plodding around in the garden, growing his vegetables. Hooray! Look, the show prize leaks. Every now and then he would go and do a, a TV show, uh, an interview or something of that sort, but there was certainly that thing of it's taking me out of where I want to be. Yeah. I like this, I feel really good now. Towards the end, we became really good friends, really properly good friends that just enjoyed each other's company. And I, I don't think that there's too much more you can ask f uh, from a father and son than that. Mwah. <laughs> Tributes were paid today to the TV comic Rod Hull, who died in a bizarre accident at his home in Sussex. 
Hull, loved and feared for the antics of his puppet Emu, was trying to adjust his TV aerial when he fell off the roof. It was without question the darkest and the bleakest um, n night of my life.